welcome to Behind the Ride with the Coal Collective. That's another season in the legs, early December. Been fielding questions for quite a few months throughout the year on kit and equipment. With the snow up there on the mountains, probably a good opportunity to show you what I've been using. So let's check it out. So, this is my latest Cannondale. It's an Evo High Mod disc. There's quite a story behind how I actually came to, to ride a Cannondale. Um, and showing my age, I uh, started working for them. I was an Uber geek, Uber fan of the, the brand. I'd actually just qualified as an engineer um, and I was sat in my office at the time and I was just watching all the pros, watching Chippo uh, and Cadell Evans winning World Cups, winning the biggest races. And of course I was inspired. I loved the team and, and as an engineer, I was a bit, bit geeky about equipment and trying to find the ultimate product. Uh, a Cannondale as a brand was, was something that really inspired me and, and I wanted to, to ride one, but uh, better than that I actually managed to, to get a job with them when I was uh, much younger than I am now. So I moved abroad, uh, started working for them and I remember going into the office, 21 year old, and I didn't, ha didn't take my road bike with me. And, uh, and I looked at a bunch of bikes, uh, they were ex-pro bikes, and they said right you need a bike so for a, for a couple of months. Uh, pick a bike and uh, and use that. So um, I just went along with my tape measure and tried to sort of measure up and, and get something which would, would fit quite well. And um, it ended up being Salvadelli's CAD 5. Uh, I think it was uh, I think it was his Euro bike. Anyway, it was a beautiful bike and it was a 56 centimeter frame. Uh, it had a 130 mil stem on it and 175 mil cranks. So fairly similar to what I was riding. And I sort of wheeled it out, sort of jumped on it, measured myself up. I basically didn't even touch the, the saddle height, um, just started riding it. And I rode that for a couple of months and I just sort of felt just so planted on it, felt so good. Um, no problems, as I say, really didn't even, didn't even adjust it, no, no stem height or saddle height. Uh, so when I actually came to build my own Cannondale, it was the following year. So it was around you know, 2000, 2001, and they just launched the CAD 6. So it was traditional road geometry as the Evo is, and it had the hologram crank, um, which was a big step forward. The BB30 had just been invented, Cannondale invented that. Again, my uber geek uh, engineering coming in. So it was a BB30 with this really oversized aluminium frame, and I built it up and I spent about three months building it up. And I was choosing all the right parts, um, and I actually put a, a set of original Sirium wheels on there. I was a campy guy at the time, I wanted it Italian style, so I put campy on. Um, but a lot of the parts are, are fairly similar to what I still ride with today. Um, and just built this amazing bike, went out for the first ride on it, obviously new bike syndrome, totally inspired, and started stomping up the first climb. It's a 5k climb, really close to where I lived. And I was about two or three sprockets down at the back and I was just, you know, massive smile on my face. And, uh, you know, those sort of original feelings always stick with me. Um, Salvadelli's bike and then getting the CAD 6. And then evolution as I was working for, for Cannondale, Evolution just uh, happened that I'd then be on the CAD 7 and then as that progressed to CAD 8 and then when the 613 where it was a, a cross hybrid carbon and aluminium, all traditional race geometry so I just never really veered from that. Uh, and then the, the System 6 uh, and then Super 6 eventually came along which is pretty much what, what the Evo um, is now. Um, with its traditional geometry and I always stuck and I just I knew that when I get a new frame it's going to be this size I'm going to put these parts on it made building a new bike really really quite simple um, but absolutely loved it the the whole sort of nature of it the, the older sort of aluminium products the CAD 6 especially personally I, I love the harsh feeling of it um, it was something for me with the right sort of finishing parts saddle seat post handlebars uh, comfort was never an issue um, but uh, Evolution, as it's happened, um, a lot of bike manufacturers, Cannondale in particular, have managed to get a lot more comfort out of the materials. So aluminium and comfort is, is something which goes quite well together now, whereas back in the day, we're talking early 2000s, and a big oversized aluminium frame uh, would be a lot less comfortable. So that, that technology just trickled through and evolved and evolved and evolved, and I find myself on the new Evo disc. Um, 2017, this is the bike which you're seeing in the later videos. Um, in most of the other videos you would have seen an Evo um, or the Evo High Mod, um, which I've been using, just the standard rim version. But uh, fundamentally geometry is fairly similar, it's race geometry as I said. 
And the actual comfort wise, now I sort of look at it and I think maybe for the riding I'm doing now in, 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 in where I am in my, my, my sort of riding, um, I should potentially be on a Synapse. Uh, Synapse is the, the sort of more endurance sportive style bike which Cannondale make. Um, but again, the experiences which I had um, on the race geometry um, frames, uh, always I just thought, well, there's, there's not a lot of point in trying to change um, something which is working. I've got a fairly long upper body. I've got fairly long arms. I've got sort of shorter legs, really, um, than, than probably I should have com compared to the length of my arms. So the race geometry, you can see it's, it's pretty low here. I've got a couple of five mil spacers, but it's pretty low at the front end, and I've kept a 130 mil stem. Um, so the, the actual position is quite low. I've, my natural riding position, um, when I'm really sort of putting the power down or suffering, whatever way you want to look at it, is low, flat back. It's just always the way I've been. Um, so I haven't practiced it like that. But so I always found that when I'm really going for it, I really need to get into that low position. Um, so arguably, arguably a, a synapse with its, its slightly sort of taller head tube a more upright position in theory should fit the type of riding I'm doing all day endurance but you know the sort of takeaway really is um, get a bike fit and, and look at your own geometry look at your own sort of dimensions and and see what's going to work best for you and if you if you find a product works really well for you I'm just going to stick with it so the the Evo high mod um, disc now as I say iteration after iteration has just got better and better but the nice things about it is at the back end They've taken a lot of the technology from uh, the Synapse. So originally the Synapse had uh, the, the chain stays and the seat stays. This is where, going back slightly, you would have seen traditionally Cannondale's had a nice hourglass seat stay and that's how they got the comfort. And then Synapse came along and they wanted to make it a really comfortable sort of all day um, road bike. So they flattened out the chain stay, flattened out the seat stays, and that gave a little bit of extra compliance in the back end. And then moving forward on aluminium and also on the Evos, they sort of adopted that technology. So back in the day of aluminium being harsh and back in the day of carbon being harsh, that's kind of completely done away with now. So I've found my personal experience is with the right contact points and the right sort of layup and design. So you've got these nice comfort features here. I mean, it's just such a smooth product to ride. So the reason I like the bike so much is I just basically don't even have to think about it. Um, I just love getting on it, you know, whatever I throw at it, um, I know that I can put as much into it as possible um, and the bike's just going to come out smiling, I'm going to come out smiling. So it's very predictable, the front end, the handling. Um, yeah, I always think that a good product is something that you don't really have to think about and you get to the end of the day and you've just thought, yeah, that was an amazing ride. Um, and that's really what the Evo High Mod does for me. Uh, you'll notice actually now that the, the disc, um, I've been on the, the rim brake forever. Uh, disc is becoming a lot more popular. So I was a little bit hesitant um, because I'm a bit more of a traditionalist. Uh, I like, you know, I was, again, it's like, I didn't really have that many problems with rim brakes in the past. Uh, braking surfaces improved even on carbon. And why change something? I'm a pretty lightweight rider. Um, I've got good experience, especially in the mountains. So, you know, knowing how to brake and not overheat a rim, uh, I didn't really think, yeah, what are the, what are the benefits? But uh, I was riding the oat route this summer and the, the, the high mod uh, disc had to be tried out. So I was actually riding my cross bike a lot with disc and I was on the road a lot on it and thinking, geez, the performance of the disc is, is quite remarkable. Um, so I thought to myself, let's build up the, uh, the disc uh, high mod um, and see what it's actually like. So I actually finished the bike off just a couple of days before the Oort route, which was always a bit of a lottery because yeah, it is a new bike and things take a little bit of time just to sort of bed themselves in. But, uh, and I jumped on it and rode the seven, seven stages, seven races. And I, straight away, again, I'm very much a rider. When I have a good experience, I'll stick with something. If I use a product and it works, I'll stick with it. I'm not going to jump around and try and like save two grams here and three grams there. That, that stuff's bomb proof. It works. It gives me great performance. Just get on with it. So, uh, and I was blown away. I knew that the cross bike was good on the road, um, but having specific road geometry, this is set up exactly how I, I would set my bikes up uh, for years and years and years. So I knew how it was going to feel very predictable. But the thing was when you're, when you've got mixed conditions, so in the mountains, one day it's sunny, the next day it's a bit overcast, the next day it's raining, the road conditions are changing. The disc, 
it's such a big improvement that the the negatives and the the reservations that I had about going to disc, which was basically the weight. You know, I'm in the mountains. You want to be light. You want all your equipment to be light um, because you're going to go uphill faster. Uh, they were completely negated when, as soon as I got on it, and you can feel the performance coming back downhill. The extra security which you feel in all conditions. Uh, we had a little bit of rain in the oat route, so I really tested it properly. Flying down the side of mountains and being out of stop is a massive advantage. So. Uh, I think it's going to be, for me, it's going to be very difficult to go back um, if I ever go back to rim brakes, but that's why I'm now on disc. I, I absolutely love them. I'm a big advocate now. Um, and you'll see the actual wheels as well while we're talking disc. Um, a little bit higher profile. This is the Cosmic Pro Carbon SL from Mavic. Uh, in the previous videos, the latest videos, you'll see these wheels. In the earlier videos, uh, generally running the Cerium Pro Carbon SL. Uh, and for me, the, the reason, I mean, I first bike which I built up, first proper Cannondale, was the CAD 6, and I put the Cerium's on because Cerium for me was just, it's a bomb-proof wheel. It's something where I can ride on the flats, I can ride in the mountains, it's, it's lightweight. Um, if I hit a big pothole, I know it's going to be strong enough. So I started with the Cerium, the aluminium sort of box section rim, um, and then as the, as the, the products evolved, it, it turned into a carbon product. And it's a lower profile, so it's only, you know, it's like 25 mil depth, uh, which means in crosswinds, being quite a lightweight rider, if it is very blustery, you can sort of feel a bit uneasy sometimes. But with the Cerium, it's a lower profile. It kept all the, all the, the performance that I wanted. So I just want to throw it in my bike box. We go traveling. Where are we next? Right, get the bike out, ride it. Don't have to worry about it. Don't have to think about it. So the Cerium for me is what you're going to see most of the videos out there, what I use. Why did I switch over to the, uh, the Cosmic Pro Carbon SL? Well, at the moment, this is the, this is the wheel which has got uh, the UST technology. So this is the tubeless technology. This is um, some experience which I've had with tubeless in the past has been not so good. And I'm going to make a bit of a video on that, uh, I think, a little bit later because this new UST tubeless uh, for the road, um, I wanted to try it out again. I was really excited to try it out. It's been probably... Uh, eight, nine years since I last used tubeless on the road. Um, so a lot of, a lot of technologies happened and a lot of um, tweaking and refining has happened since then. So uh, I'm pretty excited about the UST. So I sort of took a little bit of a compromise in my opinion for the mountains, because um, I think the Cerium UST is gonna be the wheel which is gonna be like spot on for what I'm doing. But at the moment, the UST is now offering a lot of benefits as well, especially for, especially for the latest video that we've just made, which was up the Portet uh, with quite a lot of gravel. So um, yeah, I really gave that a proper test. So that's why you'll see a slightly deeper, deeper section room at the moment. But uh, either way, I mean, in terms of performance, um, what I'm looking for in a wheel set is something that I can just get out the bike box after traveling throw it on the bike, not worry if I hit something, um, good aerodynamics, lightweight for, for climbing, uh, and just dependable performance across the board. I'm running um, 25 mil tires, front and back, uh, Ixion Pro, this is the Ixion Pro UST. Uh, prior to that, it'll be the grip link and the, the power link, so power link at the back, grip link at the front. And again, I've, I've gone from 21 mil tires back in the day because everyone thought skinny was best, skinny and pumped up rock solid, it's gotta be fast. Uh, and as we, we learn a little bit more, we realize that a little wider gives a bit more comfort. If you're more comfortable and you've got more grip, you can go around a corner quicker. So actually a little bit of extra width, uh, a little bit more comfort uh, definitely pays dividends. So I'm running a 25 mil uh, front and back, a um, bit of extra air volume. And for me, it's, and I think for most, most riders now, this is, this is the norm. Um, certainly in the pro peloton, they've, they've gone through that evolution, 23s, 25s. And in some cases when it is really rough, uh, a 28 as well on there. So that's what I'm using at the moment. So looking at the crank set, you'll actually notice for the eagle-eyed amongst you, uh, I'm now on an info crank. Uh, the original videos which you would see, uh, I was on a hologram. And for me, uh, the way that came about, again, CAD 6 was the first bike. Hologram was made in 2000. An engineer called Chris Dobman who designed BB30 and the hologram together. Um, it was just pff, 
that crank, I've used it, so I've used it up until 2017, uh, 17 years worth on the evolution of the hologram. So that's hologram, hologram SI, SISL, SISL2. And I always, I mean, I sort of didn't think that I would change from that crank because the performance just from that crank set is, is like nothing else. Um, if you've got the frame set with a BB30 and, and a hologram crank, which is super lightweight, um, incredibly efficient, incredibly rigid, uh, it just puts all that power straight into the pedals. Uh, I just think, again, why do I need to change it? But I, I've sort of had experience with power in the past and I've used SRM systems, I had a power tap, um, probably going back uh, close to a decade and I was racing, riding sportives, actually racing pretty competitively. And, you know, I had the SRM on um, and I was collecting all this data and I was looking at my head unit and I thought I was the bee's knees and I had this fancy crank on and, uh, you know, I got to the end of the ride and I would see a number, but, I, you know, I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have the, the experience and the know-how to, to actually know what to do with it. So, you know, it was just a tool that was on my bike um, because all the pros were using them. Um, and yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually really know what to do with it. So, so I sort of like, for me, I actually ended up losing a lot of the, uh, you know, the essence of why I was riding. I wanted to go out and explore. I wanted to see beautiful places. I wanted to get to the top of a mountain and the numbers, pff, yeah, they didn't really make sense. Didn't, it wasn't anything I could actually use. So I kind of got a bit bored with it and, and I stopped using power. Um, you know, yeah, you've actually got to know what to do with the numbers. So I, I took everything off and I just got back to the basics and, you know, riding my bike because I just love to go and ride. And, uh, and then as I, yeah, I mean, you start to learn a bit more about power and I learn a bit more about the products and how to use power myself and, and how to effectively train with it. Um, and I started doing a bit more research and I had the oat route last year, uh, I did the triple. So that was uh, all three of the, the European events, um, started in the Pyrenees, then we went to the Alps and finished up in the Dolomites. So it's three weeks of mountain riding. Uh, it's basically like doing a mountain stage of the Tour de France for three weeks. And I really thought to myself, hmm, you know, this is more serious than just going out and riding your bike now. And what I'd educated myself on with power meant that I had a little bit more knowledge on what to do with it. But I wanted to find a crank that sort of superseded some of the issues that I, I found in the past, which was sometimes reliability um, and accuracy, actual accuracy of the crank. So um, I did my research and I found that the info crank, um, really what they're standing for is, is accuracy. It's it's durability so that in all conditions, whether it's super hot or super cold or in the rain, um, the actual numbers that you get are very accurate. So they're always comparable. And if you've got comparable numbers, it means that when you finished a ride, you can look at actually how you performed on that day and you can, you can adjust your training to, to actually improve, which is what the whole point of having the crank on the bike is all about. So um, durability and accuracy for me is what I want. Um, so I put an info crank on. And I've been using InfoCrank. The nice thing is I haven't got a world of knowledge when it comes to power. I know the basics and I know um, some of the fundamentals or how to train with it. But uh, the guys at InfoCrank have helped me a lot in terms of looking at my, my files afterwards and sort of yeah, analyzing where I either went well or went, went badly and why I went, went badly, uh, potentially because I've, I've sort of burnt too many matches early on. And, you know, there's no lying with power. Um, it's a... It's a it's a finite source that you've got to play with at the beginning of the day. And if you burn it all up in the first hour, then you're going to struggle. Um, and they've really made me understand this a lot more. Uh, and I think that's a really, really good thing as a, a rider that wants to improve. Um, having a system that is very accurate, very durable, but also having the support afterwards. So once you've, you've got the crank on your bike, you can talk to the guys and actually say, look, these are my goals. This is what I'm going to be doing. Um, how can I reach that goal? And having guys with way more experience than, than I've personally got looking at what you're doing and giving you advice, um, almost like a mentor, it, it worked really well. And I'm, I'm really thankful to, to be able to use the product um, and also have that sort of support mechanism as well. But the great thing is it's not just available to me. So as part of the, the Info Crank package, you've got um, access to the, all of their tools to, to help you become a better rider. So uh, chainring wise, um, the evolution which I've been on, I'm now on 3450, uh, which I've got a bunch of chainrings which I need to wear out. So 3450, it's, it's sort of the traditional compact. And I think the first sportives that I did when I was in Europe, um, you know, 3953, nothing else existed. So 3953 with a 
uh, an 11 or a 12, 25 on the back. Um, I thought that was a, a pretty low gear at the time. Uh, certainly grinding up the Galibier, I could have done with a, a lower gear, but you know, that's just what we had. And then the sort of, it's not quite semi-compact, but 36, 50 came around and that was a good compromise so I did tons of mountain riding on 3650 and then compact came and I think I'm seeing this correlation with age and lower gearing <laughs> you know 34 um, 34 on the, the front and you know a 28 on the back now is, is my sort of standard gear 3450 28 on the back uh, I can generally get over most things on that, um, sometimes a little bit, bit of a grind, but um, that's the, the sort of standard setup. I think the new um, semi-compact, um, which is sort of fairly recently been introduced, where you've got a 36 and a 52, uh, I think that's going to be good. I can see myself adopting that in the future, but as I say, a few, few parts to wear out first. Um, and I've also, you know, I, I do get asked the question a lot about gearing in the mountains. What gearing should I use? What do you use? Um, it doesn't matter what I use. I mean, I know what I can get up a hill in. And, you know, if I ask a pro what gearing they use, phew, it doesn't matter because <laughs> they're a lot stronger. So, you know, I've found that generally 34, 28 on the back gets me over most things. Uh, but the big exception, Alt route this year, first stage in the Pyrenees, um, in the Basque country, super steep out there. And yeah, I learned a lot with the info crank. We analyzed the file. Um, it was a bit of a funny story, actually. I, uh, I found a little spot on the side of the road before, before the race started. And I thought, you know, we've got three, four hours on the bike. I, I've got to go to the loo. So nature call, went to the loo quickly. And then of course I, I had to chase to get back on. Uh, and work my way up to the to the front and I burnt so many matches and you're just thinking well we're at the start I've just got to go hard to to get back to the to the front but when we looked at the file afterwards and I suffered at the end like suffered big time obviously you say well I tried too hard at the front but you could see the the power curve and how long through the uh, through the algorithm and through the actual program um, which InfoCrank have got you could see how long it took me to recover from that before I was back not in the green from a heart rate perspective but actually in the green from being able to perform at pushing power at threshold perspective and it took ages it took a long time and I was like Oof, first stage learned a lot even so I've been riding forever um, and I, I finished that stage and I just said to myself, I mean, I was nervous. I was, I, I pushed it too hard. I, I didn't follow the, the plan I should have done, which is conservative start, um, because, uh, because of a nature break. And, uh, so then I came in and I put a 32 on the back and, you know, that's a super low gear, you know, 34, 32, uh, is a really low gear. It's, it's the gear, which I really recommend for everyone. If you're sort of new to the mountains or, I mean, I, I kept it on actually after the oat route as well, because we were traveling, we were filming videos, and I just thought, yeah, with this gear, I know that I'm never gonna have any problems. And um, certainly trying to recite uh, cycling stats, riding up a 2000 meter peak, it's easier if I can actually get some air in my lungs still. So, you know, 32, generally a 28 on the back, but uh, never afraid to, to, you know, put a lower gear on just to keep the legs spinning. So while we're talking about gearing, uh, you'll notice I've got the, the latest Shimano Di2, um, and it's 11 speed, uh, quite normal nowadays. Uh, my history with Di2, actually, I was a, I was a campy guy. Um, I like that sort of Italian, I just like the feel of them. So I, I built some of my earlier bikes with Campag. But then I think I got to uh, the first challenge that I did in the Alps, uh, 2013. Um, I had an Evo and it came with full Dura Ace Di2 and I was super excited. I was just like, yeah, I mean, I've got this electronic gearing. And I'd read the press about it and it was, you know, it's amazing stuff. Um, so I started using it and I mean, it sounds really strange, but my first reaction with DI2 um, was, well, one, it's just, it just works so well. Um, it's Shimano, they, they generally, they, they really perfect what they're doing. They put it to market and it's, it's a really great product. Um, I haven't, haven't deviated from that since because it works so well. Um, but what I found back then when I was doing big challenges, um, sort of riding across mountain ranges and through the night, uh, it was strange. I would finish a huge ride and uh, yeah, maybe ride in for 30 plus hours. Um, and, and I just, it's not something you normally relate to, but having fresh hands and fresh arms, it's a big thing when you're endurance riding um, and, you know, continually shifting and actually using that, that power to shift into the big chain ring and using that sort of swing on your, on your wrist. Uh, with the DI2, poof, you know, it's a button. You didn't even have to move your hands. So, you know, again, it was a product that 
I thought would be cool. Oh yeah, it's cool. It's DI2. And then suddenly I was just like, yeah, actually using it. And um, from the endurance side, it was just like, yeah, it blew me away. Really super quick shifting and that. So it's a, it's a slight hybrid at the moment. I've been on the um, full Durace uh, DI2, but now with the hydraulic, I've got their sort of standard hydraulic shifters on. Um, and same with the calipers. Uh, maybe I'll upgrade one day uh, to the, the full Durace because it looks just super sweet. And then the Dralias are the actual, you know, the top end Durace. So ever since then, um, in those big endurance rides, I've, I've always stuck with DI2 and, and just got on well with it and loved it. Um, some, sometimes people, um, I've actually, you know, always fielding questions and it's like, how reliable is it? And is the battery going to go flat and things like this? All the sort of things which my reservations with a cable, pff, you're never going to have a problem, but it just, you set it up. The great thing is you just set it up. Even when you're going out and you're in the winter and you're, normally your cables would get all gunked up, you never have that problem because it's, it's, got a, it's, it's electric. So your gears always work well and I just set, set it up and leave it. In terms of battery life, I mean, I probably charge it yeah, maybe once a month just to keep the battery, you know, just give it a quick check. Oh yeah, I've got, how much have I got left on here? Yeah, I mean, I've still got, yeah, that's, that's top power. Um, so more than 80% power. And yeah, I've just periodically checked that, but it's never an issue. It lasts for months um, and it's just been great stuff. So that's why I've always used that. So contact points, so handlebar and saddle pedals as well but uh, the main contact points for comfort handlebar and saddle uh, I'm on the Aliante physique and um, I mean I get a lot of a lot of flack let's call it or a lot of feedback uh, about not actually needing a saddle so I'm always climbing out the saddle but I do actually use it and you can see this is actually quite worn so there's a little bit of uh, a bit of proof that I do use the saddle occasionally and I've always used the Aliante well since they they introduced it years and years and years ago um, and I just found that for me um, and, and how I sit and everything comfort wise, it's got this sort of dip um, and it's quite well padded actually. It's pretty well padded saddle. So with the sort of carbon rails for a bit of extra comfort and they're, they're what they call twin flex technology underneath here, allows a bit of give and you can see there's quite, quite a bit of give in it. So even when I was on, I think I put the, uh, one of the first Aliantes on um, my CAD 6 back in 2000, 2000, 2001. And despite the fact that that was sort of big, oversized aluminium, deemed a pretty harsh frame, um, super efficient, but with an Aliante saddle and the right handlebar, I found that yeah, I never had a problem even on the longest rides. So again, um, it worked well, just tried and tested by myself and, and I just stuck with it. So on my cross bike, on my mountain bikes, um, the road bikes, I just, this is actually a, a bit of an older model um, because Again, I sort of wear it in and before it's worn out, well, I'm not going to change it just for the sake of it. So it's uh, still got a lot of life left in it, but I just really like the shape. So um, Physique Aliante, but a saddle is such a personal thing that you really need to test it out for yourself. Um, find something, whether you need a, a sort of cutaway in the middle or anything else. But the only way where you can really find um, if the saddle is going to work for you is uh, by testing it and riding loads of hours in it. So moving on to the handlebars, this is uh, a carbon bar from USE, the company Ultimate Sports Engineering. Um, it's part of their Ultimate range, so it's their, their top end sort of flagship race orientated product, so it's super lightweight. Um, it's 420 millimeters center to center. Uh, there's no real science behind the width of it. I sort of just measured my, my shoulders and I wanted something that when you're riding, when I'm on the tops, um, I can really open my chest up. It's not super narrow. Um, I could go narrower, um, but you know, potentially a narrower bar is better for aerodynamics because you're gonna close your shoulders in. Um, but where I'm climbing, I want a bar that I can sit upright on and I can open my, my chest up. So 420 millimeters center to center is, a, is the width that I found just comfortable. My hands just went into that position nicely. Um, and my history with, with USE as a company um, stems back for longer than my history with Cannondale, which, which is a long time. And the first components which I used were, were their seat post and handlebars, but on the mountain bike. And I was building up a mountain bike. I was, you know, racing at a high level and 
I wanted the lightest stuff. I wanted the, the coolest looking stuff. It's always important. And um, USC were making the anodized, you know, it's like anodized handlebar, match the anodized seat post and the skewers. And, you know, it's all the small details. And, uh, and I just started using the, the mountain bike handlebar and seat post. Um, it matched the bike really well. And, you know, the design hasn't changed that much. The alien seat post is, is a classic. Um, I've just got on well because it's super lightweight. Um, it's, it's just something which, again, a, bit, a little bit like what I said about the Evo, I get on it and I ride it. It's it, the performance. I was throwing my mountain bike around, um, jumping off and on, and, you know, I couldn't fault the performance of it. So naturally, when I started building up my road bikes, I said, well, it worked well on the mountain bike. What can I do on the, on the, on the roadside as well? And the more I got to know about the company um, and the sort of philosophy behind the company, um, it kept me a, a, loyal, a loyal customer because the owner um, is a super smart guy, just, just really looks at problems and, and how he can solve them and if something's not on the market, how he can, he can make it, bring it to market. And I think one of their original products was the, um, the suspension seat post. I mean, we're talking when I was mountain biking originally before you have one bike which does everything. Um, so it's not full suspension or anything. So, of course, you're going across bumpy, bumpy ground. How can you give a bit more comfort? And they made the suspension seat post. And again, my sort of techie engineering background, I was like, well, that's a pretty cool product. And it was anodized blue or purple at the time, probably purple at the time. And I thought, wow, that looks, that looks smart. And I learned a bit more about the company and that's really the philosophy that they had. So, um, again, it sort of takes a bit of my history and my, my geekiness as, as wanting the best product and my engineering side and, and rolls it into a great product. Um, so I've always stuck with that. The, the actual bend on the bar is, I, I'd call it, it, it's pretty traditional. Bars have sort of got more compact, so you can be on the drops without such a big, big drop from when I started riding road bikes properly you know the drop on the bar was was, was quite a bit bigger than that but now um, it's, it's quite a standard shape I like it because it's, it's there's nothing which is on this bar which is anything to think about like whoa, you know there's a little bump here or a kink there or an aero part there it's just a really nice solid you know performing bar which is lightweight and the shape's really good um, you know, it's, it's a nice, it offers a nice platform for just when you're on the tops and I say opening your lungs up when you're climbing. Um, so of course, if I've got the, uh, the seat post and the bars, then I, yeah, small details. I want to marry every, everything up with the, the same, uh, the same brand. So the ultimate race stem, um, again, CNC manufactured. Um, I just love the look of it. I just think it looks cool um, because you know you take a, a block of aluminium and you machine it out, and I think it's everything's going carbon. It's carbon this, carbon this, carbon that. But just to see nice, proper, solid engineering, um, I just always like that. Again, my geekiness coming in, and uh, so I've used the the race stem uh, on all my bikes uh, pretty much since since the beginning. Um, as the products have evolved, obviously just upgraded. Um, it's 130 mil, which I was originally using 120, and just going back to uh, the Salvadelli days. So I was on a 56, and all my Cannondales were 56 centimeters, um, and I really thought that that was the, the right size. But the geometry sort of over the years just evolved a little bit here and, and shifted a bit there, and I measured things up again, and I was sort of getting to the point where I was thinking actually maybe. Maybe I should go for a slightly smaller frame size and a longer stem. Um, so the the black uh, Evo, which is has done a lot of a lot of videos now, you see that all over. Uh, that's a 54. Anything before that, uh, that would have been a 56. But now I'm on a 54. Um, maybe I'm shrinking, but it feels great. So um, seat post, uh, handlebar, and stem, all from USE Ultimate Sports Engineering, and and it kind of. I guess that's a good segue onto the lights, which I've got sort of on the handlebar and the seat post as well. Um, back when I was a kid, I would just, I mean, you'd only think about lights when you're riding at night. Um, yeah, it's getting dark, put the lights on, but especially in the mountains. And I've just found that visibility uh, is just more and more cyclists on the road, more and more, uh, more, and more traffic. Um, you just need to be visible uh, at all times. So. You generally see, uh, certainly in the later videos, and that I'm 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 running lights all the time, 
And it's not necessarily to say, hey, I need to light the road up, but I want to be seen. In the mountains, you've got tunnels and changing weather real super quick. So it can go from a bright day to suddenly overcast and raining. So um, these are really sort of safety lights, um, really just awesome because they're super lightweight. Um, it's the Trace and Trace R from USC. Uh, exposure lights, it's the same company. And yeah, they just stay on the bike now because they take the, they're marginal when it comes to weight, but at the, at the end of the day, safety's uh, the most important factor. Um, and I started using, uh, it's not just, I mean, because I had a good relationship with, with, with USE, and when they started making exposure lights, um, I was actually back in the day, again, racing mountain bikes, 24 hour mountain bike races. And that evolved onto um, some mountain challenges where I was um, riding through the night over mountains. Um, but really from the mountain bike days, I, I sort of did some 24 hour mountain bike racing and, and I was looking for a system that was, you know, again, lightweight, good performance, easy to use, something which you just put on, use, get on with it, get on with the job, enjoy riding your bike. And when Exposure first launched their, their lights years ago, um, it coincided with the time when I was, I was doing 24 hour racing. And at the time I was looking for a light system and it was, you know, you'd have a battery in a bottle cage or a battery strapped to the bike um, and, you know, a bunch of wires. And then if you come into the pits and you need to change something like a helmet light, you, you know, you're unwinding stuff. And it just seemed messy. Um, and I think that's, again, why I liked uh, USC as a company and exposure lights, because they just simplified things. So I remember I bought the joystick which is the helmet light. And then I had a race light on the front or a max D on the front, um, which is, you know, they use the, the super LEDs and, and it was just awesome because all the batteries, you know, the batteries are inside, even on the bigger lights, you've got no cables, no, uh, you don't need to sacrifice a bottle cage for, for putting a battery on. And, you know, that was my, that was the sort of stepping stone. And then when I did my challenges, it was like, okay, I'm going to need a much more firepower than a, a, a trace at the front there. Um, so I've used all the lights across the range, depending on what I'm doing, always a joystick on the helmet. I would say actually, if you're doing night riding, because it's something I, I really enjoy um, with some of our cycle tours now, we've, we take some of our guests out at, uh, at dawn to watch the sun come up at the, the top of the Tourmalet or Hortacam or, or the Abisque. And uh, it's amazing, you know, it, it's a whole different perspective when you're out riding at night um, on familiar roads, but suddenly they take on a, a whole different personality. So. Um, we beef up the firepower when we go on those rides and, and the challenges that I've done in the past as well. So I've got a lot of history from, from the very early days with exposure lights and they just made my life easier. So I stick them on now. I want to be safe. I want to be seen. And, you know, they're, they're a cool British company that, that really stand for what the, the products which they make and the engineering behind it. And uh, they're cool enough to put little laser etches on some of our products as well. So again, attention to detail is always nice, makes you feel a little special. Um, and I think Saddlebag, you know, this is generally um, in here, I've got basics, very basics. Um, I used to have a couple of tubes in the back of the Saddlebag. Uh, now I run one tube and I've, I take a tire lever, a multi-tool, and um, some, some little self-adhesive patches. So if I do puncture, then I can patch a tube quickly. So nothing too out of the ordinary um, from that setup. But I, I try to keep everything that I need on my bike um, where it should be. So, you know, my saddlebag's always there. If I puncture, I come back, right? If I uh, use the tube out on the road, change the tube straight away. I come back into the garage, put a new tube in straight away, get rid of the old one because you know the next rider a couple of days later when you go out you, you forget and if you have a an incident then you the, the moment you remember is that that second when your back tire has gone flat so you know it's always try and do my maintenance as, as early as possible um, and then the only other thing which I really have is a pump uh, on the frame again just keep everything on the bike so you know where your bottles are you've got a pump saddlebag lights everything's there it's ready to go if lights need charging get them charged as soon as you uh, come in um, that way I've occasionally I've, I've changed bikes and I've thought ah damn it I didn't put my pump on I'm halfway through a ride and you know I didn't have a problem but um, you get to the end of the road or, or middle of the ride you're thinking to yourself oh I hope I don't punch you because I've, I forgot my pump it's on my other bike so I just keep that on the bike um, it's all good and then finally up front, you'll see I've got a, a Lazine uh, GPS unit um, in, I call it cold collective blue, but uh, I, I don't think they thought that when they made them. It's a special edition. It's the enhanced super GPS. And I was a big Garmin user, I think 
pretty much most of most of the world were were, were riding with Garmin, um, and they were great units. Uh, and I used them for for a long, long time. Challenges and navigation. Um, I remember my early days with you know maps being blown away in the back pocket and getting sweaty. And you know the Garmin's really uh, took away a lot of that stress, which was nice. Um, and as things evolved, I was again. I'm always just kind of like looking for something to make my riding easier, make my life a bit easier. Um, and I found that I, the big endurance rides I, w I was doing uh, through the night rides and that battery power was always something I was like, well, how do I get enough battery power out of this little unit? Um, so I ended up using external batteries on, uh, on my, my top tube, trying to power a Garmin for long enough. Uh, so it was always a bit of a, like a compromise. As I say, I like clean, everything clean. The bike looks super clean, clean lines. Uh, everything's functional. It should just be there doing its job. And um, with the Garmin, with a bunch of leads and external battery, it was always a bit of a compromise. And then I, I, I found the mapping was tricky. It was tricky to actually use the mapping on, on something which was trying to guide me somewhere. So um, learned a bit, a bit, a little bit more about the design head unit. And um, uh, what I like most about it actually is, is battery power. The battery power is going to last me over a day, um, which for the most part is, is, is going to see, see me through everything I'm doing. Um, and then also the mapping, they use an app uh, which is on your phone. I always have my phone with me. So when I'm out and about and I'm on a bike, uh, if I want to go, kind of find out where I am, I just use the, the mapping on the phone. So what Lizine did is they said, well, everyone's using their phone. So let's just make sure our phone and our head unit sync together and the app does that. So if I want to go on a big ride, then I, I load my, my ride up on, from, through the app and then I get my turn by turn instructions on the head unit. So it kind of, I haven't got on the handlebar mapping, but I don't need it because my phone's in my back pocket. So it's a real neat solution. Battery power is one thing, but also the, the fundamental of what I wanted to use a GPS unit for was to be able to go from A to B and not, not have to get my map out. Um, that makes it really easy. Um, so there's no zooming or anything. The other thing which is actually good is another thing where, um, you know, touchscreen on a mobile phone is one thing. And, you know, everyone, if you've got an iPhone or a touchscreen, um, they, they work really good uh, for the most part. Uh, I've personally found that, you know, if you've got a set of gloves on or if, if the screen gets wet, either through sweat or in the rain, I was always like trying to change my screen and it was just, <laughs> I was just getting sort of a little bit frustrated with just not being able to use it properly. So it, there's no touch screen, it's just a button back to, back to basics and keeping it simple um, and actually looking at a problem where, whether it's a mapping or a battery issue, um, the design unit has been, has been really good uh, and I've been using it for the last probably couple of years. Um, and they're just evolving all the time. So a couple of little things that I, I sort of wanted to address have now been addressed. And again, just comes back to yeah, making a nice, a nice bike that you can just get on and ride. So, you know, I'm, I think I'm probably one of the fortunate people, um, you know, I, I wasn't in a pro team, so I wasn't, I wasn't told I had to use this equipment. And that's really cool because, you know, back in the day when I was building my own bikes, um, I got the chance to, to just pick the bits I wanted. And that started with Mavic wheels. It started with a Cannondale frame when I started working with them. Um, it started from my mountain bike days with seat posts and, and handlebars and, you know, then mountain biking through lights and, hey, the saddle worked for me. So, you know, I've, I've just, you know, this is sort of 17 years of evolution, really. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I've got to say, I absolutely love the bike. Um, every time I go out on it, I'm just, yeah, I just feel like I want to ride faster and harder and longer and sometimes I just, you know, you just get lost in the moment and um, for me that's, that's a sign of a special product and um, one thing which always makes me, makes me laugh and smile is you think that you've got the ultimate um, and then another one, two, three years down the line a little bit of material has been shaved here and the frame's got lighter there and the wheels are performing slightly better here and the brakes are better and you know it's just a continual evolution so this is what i'll be riding certainly um, for the next good few videos i'm super super proud of it and um, yeah i can't wait to see where the technology's going but uh, until then i'm going to enjoy this and yeah make it count so um, that's a bit of background on the bike if uh, if there's anything in particular that you want to know about um, then just leave a comment um, give me a shout social media um, we'll try and do a few more of these videos 
uh, try and help you out with all the questions which you've got and um, hopefully get you riding better and enjoying the, uh, the great outdoors. So thanks for watching, ride safe and enjoy. Thank you.